Hello, and welcome to this quick little video on how to do two population procedures using R. So let's go ahead and start up R. Notice I've got the console on the left, the script window on the right, so everything that goes over here on the right is what I'm going to submit. Uh, first step, I'm going to load in those extra functions, those helpful, helpful functions. Functions loaded correctly, excellent. Next, I'm going to load the data. Data again will be this, uh, the stat grades data set. No problem. Uh, just to make sure that it was loaded correctly, I'll do summary of SG. So there we got ID, grade, gender, GPA for the student, SAT mass score for the student, age of the student, and college the student belongs to. Let's go ahead and attach data set. And just to make things really interesting, let's go ahead and create a new variable. We're going to create a variable called got pass. This variable is going to be take on the value of pass if the grade is greater than or equal to 70%, and it's going to take on the value fail if the grade is not greater than or equal to 70%. So it, you can read this as if grade greater than or equal to 70, then pass, else fail if you want. Go ahead and run that. Let's go ahead and, and just look at a summary of that variable. Doesn't tell us too much when we just apply the summary function. It's because it's a character variable. It doesn't really know how to deal with character variables. However, if we do table, we're going to get our frequency table. 34 students failed, 66 students passed. That's out of the 100 students altogether. So let's go ahead and do normal overlay, because remember, we've got to understand our variables. And the hypothesis for this first part is going to be that the GPA does not depend, or the average GPA for males is the same as the average GPA for females. So let's go ahead and get to look at the GPA for males. We're going to do a normal overlay plot. GPA is going to be the variable. Then in brackets, it's going to be the condition that gender is double equals, quote, male. And there's our norm overlay for males, the GPA for males. It looks like it could be normally distributed. It's believable, just looking at that. For females, it's going to be exactly the same, except instead of gender double equals male, it's going to be gender double equals female. That doesn't look as much normal as the males did, but we could run a test later to find out. And then, of course, box plot. This definitely looks as though the average GPA for females is higher than the average GPA for males. Got a couple females that are outliers. I don't know. Let's move on. T-test. Last handout, we were looking at the performing a t-test on the GPA. Here we're going to look at t-test of the GPA as divided by gender. That's a tilde. And as we discussed back in handout video 1a, when you have a tilde, that means what comes before is the dependent variable. What follows is the independent variable. Here, same. But the usual interpretation is that what comes before is the measurement that we care about, and what comes after is the grouping variable. So we run this, and we get the usual output. The test statistic is 1.6167. That's a t-test statistic on degrees of freedom of 97.579. Gives us a p-value of 10.9 of 0 0.1092. Because this is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis conclude that we did not detect a difference in average GPA between males and females. 95% confidence interval includes the value 0, so that means exactly the same thing. We were not able to exclude 0 as a reasonable difference in the mean GPAs. The mean female GPA in this group is 3.16. The mean male GPA in this group of students is 3.00. And I do want to emphasize again that this is the sample mean, 
for females and the sample mean for males. What the t-test was doing up here was determining if the population means differed based on these sample means. So what is the assumption of the t-test? Well, nowadays the only assumption is normality. Uh, the, just as in the t-test last time, the measurement had to come from a normal distribution. It's the same requirement here, except we're going to phrase it slightly different. The measurement has to come from a normal distribution in each of the two genders. So an easy way of doing that is the Shapiro test. Notice last week it was Shapiro.test. This week it's going to be Shapiro test where the T is capitalized. Well, the first T is capitalized. We run that, and we find out that the p-value for male GPA, whether or not it's distributed normally, is 0.05. It's pretty close to 0.05. We can't reject the null hypothesis that the male GPA is normally distributed, but it's pretty close. The female p-value, however, is 0 0.0002 which is strong evidence that the female GPAs did not come from a normal distribution. Because at least one of those two did not come from a normal distribution, because at least one of the assumptions was violated, we should not use the t-test. The test we should use is going to be the mann whitney wilcoxon test. In R, that's just wilcox.test, and then in parentheses, GPA tilde gender. Notice the difference between this line and this line. In the t-test, it's just t.test and GPA tilde gender. In the Wilcoxon-Mann-Whitney test, or the Mann-Whitney-Wilcoxon test, it's Wilcox.test. And the output looks very similar. And again, if you want a confidence interval, specify conf int equals true. Test statistic the Mann Whitney Wilcoxon test statistic is W equals 1469.5. That corresponds to a p value of 0 0.1085. Notice it's not too different from the p value for the t test. Large sample size suggests that those two are going to be pretty close. Confidence interval contains zero. So whether you look at the p-value or you look at the confidence interval and whether it contains zero, we did not detect a difference between average GPAs for males versus females. Here the average difference in location, that is the average difference in, in um, the average difference in GPAs for males and females for this sample is 0.16. Notice that the Wilcoxon rank sum test just gives the difference. The t test gives the sample means. And notice these also do differ by about 0.16. All right. So that's looking at GPA by gender, uh, testing hypotheses about whether or not the GPA actually did differ between males and females according to gender. Let's look at the pass rate. Um, between males and females. So first, go ahead and look at the graphic. Gender is one dichotomous variable. Got pass is the other. So there's our box plot. Uh, sorry, bar plot. It looks like very few females failed, but a lot of males failed and passed there's more females that pass than males. So it looks like, according to this graphic, there's going to be a difference in the pass rate, even if there was no difference in the GPA rate. So let's go ahead and do the proportions test. I'm going to copy and paste. It's prop test. And if all you have is the raw data, you'll feed the prop test to the table itself. If you have more than just the data, I mean, if you have just the summary of the data, then you can give it the summary data, prop test. You have to specify two values for x and two values for n. 
whether you run it with the raw data or with the summary data, you're going to get the same results because it's based on the same data. Test statistic here is the chi-squared test statistic. Its value is 25.071. Corresponds to a p-value of much less than alpha. We're very, very confident that our rejection of the null hypothesis is correct. It's about a one in a million chance that we'd be wrong if we fail if we rejected the null if we failed to if we reject the null. That's what the p-value is. At some level, it's a probability that you're wrong in rejecting the null hypothesis. So there is a difference. What kind of difference is there? Do males fail at a higher rate or do females? To know that, you can't just look at the the results of the chi-squared test or the proportions test. You actually have to look at the cross tape. So first step is to define the table and then if you recall back to video 1A we can get across the margins meaning that females passed at a rate of 93.3 percent males passed at a rate of 0.436 or you can focus on the passing. Of those who passed, 63% uh, were female, 36% were male. This second interpretation is only appropriate if the number of females and the number of males are equal. As for the um, first interpretation, that works regardless. So the female pass rate is much higher than the male pass rate. It is, we were able to detect the difference statistically, and it looks as though it is not just a statistically significant result. It actually is an important result in that it means something. The female pass rate is almost twice that of the male pass rate. It's kind of interesting. So the first group of tests looked at comparing means. The second group of tests looked at comparing proportions. This third group of tests, which is only one test, looks at comparing variances. So var dot test is the function. Inside the parentheses, the measurement tilde, the grouping variable, dependent tilde, independent variable. And the output looks very similar in style, so you know what to look for. The test statistic is 0.7602 p-value is 0 0.3503. What that tells us is since the p-value is greater than alpha, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. We were unable to detect a difference in variances of GPA for males and females. The ratio of variances female to males is 0.76. Now how did I know it was females to males? F comes before M in the alphabet. If I want to know the sample ratio for males to females, I just about, um, take the reciprocal of this 0.76. P-value is 0.35. 95% confidence interval contains the value 1. Because we're looking at ratios, a ratio of 1 means there's no difference. Previously, we were looking at differences. Differences of zero mean there's no difference. And if the confidence interval contained zero, we'd have to conclude we did not detect a difference. For ratios of variances, if the variances are equal, their ratio is one, so we look to see if the confidence interval contains the value one, not zero. And that's it. Now, realistically, it doesn't mean much if the GPA variances are the same. Don't think of it in terms of GPA. Think of it in terms of stock prices. The risk for stock is the variance of that stock's price. So if you're comparing the risk of holding IBM versus the risk of holding Apple, this may be something that matters to you. You test for equality of variances between the two. But as for GPA, it doesn't mean that much if their variances are different. Hope this was helpful. I'll see you in class. Take care.